Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Mike Collins. Astronauts of Apollo 11 landed on the moon in 1969. The three-man team traveled more than 450,000 miles to the moon and back to that barren, desolate world. Why did they go? Well, for one, they wanted to know if it was possible. They wanted to explore the universe in which we live. But there was another reason, something more fundamental than that. They wanted to help us understand our origins, where we come from, and ultimately our place in the universe. Specifically, they went for some of this, moon rocks. Studying rocks from the moon and the chemical makeup locked within these rocks, we can start to unravel the history of the solar system, how life condensed, the Earth condensed from a ball of gas, and ultimately how life started here on Earth. But in order to do that, you need one of these, a rocket. This is the Saturn V the biggest, baddest launch vehicle mankind has ever built. But as amazing and worthwhile as that, rocket, that moon program was, there are problems with this. It's expensive, it's risky, it takes a long time to build a moon program. I'm a planetary scientist, and I study the solar system from Venus all the way out to Pluto. I'd love to get a ride on that rocket, to go to the moon, pick up a piece of the moon, and study its secrets. But what if you didn't have to go to space in order to get rocks from space? What if you could get a piece of the asteroid belt, the moon, Mars, right here on Mother Earth? Where would you go, and how far would you be willing to get, to get them? Well, there is an answer. Welcome to Antarctica. It is the coldest, windiest, most remote place on Earth. It is the size of the continental US and is populated by penguins, seals, and scientists. <laughs> Temperatures range from a warm 60 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer to a bone-chilling 130 below in the winter. In the summer, scientists flock to Antarctica to study nature at work, a true place of wonder. And every year for the past four decades, NASA and the National Science Foundation have sent scientists to this place in search for space rocks, meteorites. Last year, I was super lucky to have been selected as part of that team. I can't tell you the life-changing experiences that I had down on the continent, and I'd like to share some of that with you tonight. We left the day after Thanksgiving, boarded a military transport bound for Antarctica. The newbies, the people like us who had never been on the ice before, glued our eyes to the windows, couldn't quite believe what we were seeing. And before long, we landed on an ice runway made of ice called Pegasus. For so many years, we had been waiting, applying, months preparing. We were ecstatic. We were elated. We were selfie stick happy. We moved inland to McMurdo Station, the largest scientific outpost on the continent. This Alaskan-like backwater town was a mishmash of scientists, engineers, military personnel, and service folk. And for many, this was the end of the line. They would spend the entire summer here studying nature, geology, biology, astrophysics, climate change, but not us. We were going deeper into the abyss. Between McMurdo Station and South Pole lies the Trans-Antarctic Mountains. The vast mountain range is as long as the Rockies, with peaks higher still. And it is for this reason we've come here. As meteorites fall through the atmosphere and land on the ice, the natural movement of the glacier hits the mountains and starts to funnel and concentrate those meteorites for us. Combined with a lot less terrestrial rock, it helps us to hunt those meteorites down effectively. So we start training, getting to know our team members, bonding as a single unit, and packing. Lots and lots of packing. Imagine going to REI with a blank check, <laughs> taking everything you need 
for an eight-person team for a four-week period. Tents, stoves, sleeping bags, satellite phones, and yes, water bottles and pee bottles. You don't get those two confused. <laughs> After two weeks, we were more than ready. It took two of these transports to put us into deep field. We loaded everything up, and we were on our way. For hours, we flew over just magnificent scenery, stuff that you only see in documentaries, stuff that you dreamed about but now made real. We landed, unloaded our gear, and the pilots kept their engines running until we did three things. First, set up a tent for shelter. Two, put a stove on for heat. And three, called up McMurdo Station on our satellite phones for communication. And that was it. No sooner had they landed, they took off again, leaving us all alone, completely quiet. That cold is like nothing you've ever experienced before. It goes right to your bone, right to your soul. Your primal instincts to survive starts to kick in. This isn't good. This, <laughs> this isn't normal. But we carry on, put up base camp, and for four weeks, we lived this primitive life, cooking in tents, chipping 10,000-year-old glacier ice for drinking water, and yes, pooping in buckets. For four weeks, we didn't shower, we didn't shave, and I barely changed our clothes. So no big deal, right, being a student? <laughs> we ventured further out to look where we had set up camp, Nothingness. No mammals, no seals, no birds, no humans, no cell phone coverage, nothing. We were truly alone, and we had work to do. So the next day, we rolled out on our skidoos, searching for meteorites. As a teammate said, it's like an Easter egg hunt, trying to find small black chocolatey goodness on the ice. But this time, it was on a massive scale and we didn't know where those Easter eggs were hidden, either. We had to have a plan if we were to succeed. So we formed these skirmish lines between our skidoos, and we'd drive up the ice, separated by 30 feet each. What a stupid thing to be doing. There we were, thousands of miles from home, hundreds of miles from rescue, if we needed it, with people we barely knew, trying not to fall down crevasses, because that would be bad trying to get frostbite, because that would be equally bad. Sometimes on our hands and knees, trying to find rock from space. <laughs> I don't think we thought this through. At one point, we come to a dead end, a conf confluence of glacier and mountain. We had to turn back, but before we did, we just sat, rested, looking and feeling very small. And after lots of hard work, we finally found one. A small black pebble that drifted through space lands on the ice, waiting centuries for us to harvest. And after days and weeks pass, we find more and more. By the end of the four weeks we pulled out of deep field, we had found and collected 569 meteorites. We had come full circle because those meteorites, those pieces of the asteroid belt of the moon, and yes, maybe even from Mars, were then shipped back to NASA's Johnson Space Center, where they're now curated and studied right next to the Apollo moon rocks. And for us, well, in many ways, we had become those astronauts too. We had left the comforts of home, traveled a great distance to explore this barren, hostile, wonderful world, and come back and told the tale. And like those Apollo moon rocks, our meteorites would be studied for years to come. Our contributions were small, but I'm proud to add our collection to theirs. Thank you. <laughs>